people, the good lion dodgers are the people who have handed down our genes. Now, you've alluded to it multiple times. Let's now get into the theory that with all the hacks and horsepower and our visual cortex and with different evolutionary pressures, different things could be constructed. Let's start by maybe talking about what you call the interface theory of perception. Our assumption that evolution by natural selection shaped our perceptions to show us the truth. That theory I claim is wrong. What evolution has done instead is much more like shaping the interface on your computer, which, as we talked about, is there not to show you the diodes and resistors and voltages and magnetic fields. It's there to hide the truth and to simplify the reality in a way that you can use it to do what you need to do. It shows you a little paintbrush so you can paint. It shows you a little email icon so you can make email. It shows you a trash can. The relationship with the reality is not one of resemblance. It's not one of similarity. There are causal relationships, of course, between your interface and the objective reality. And that's why you can control the reality. But what you're seeing is utterly unlike that reality. So the claim is that when we perceive space and time, that's just our desktop. We're not seeing a pre-existing space and time. The idea that space has existed and was the pre-existing stage before any life and before any consciousness, that's wrong, according to this interface theory. Space is something that you create right now. It's a data structure that you create for data compression and error correction of information about fitness. And then three-dimensional objects are the same thing. They are data structures that you create. I look over here and see a chair. I'm creating a data structure that's telling me certain fitness information. I look away. I no longer see the chair, but as computer scientists say, I'm garbage collecting that data structure. I'm throwing it away to save memory. Now I look back and I see the chair and I create that data structure again because now I need that data structure. The chair that I perceive is there to help me. It's not there to show me the truth. Just like Michael Watson's basket of ivy is there to help him, for example, in cooking and so forth, it's not there to show him the truth. There is no real basket of ivy out there. That's, that's silly. None of us would believe that there's a basket of ivy when you're tasting Angostura bitters. Take the lesson from Michael Watson and apply it to every physical object around you. They're no more resembling the nature of objective reality any more than Michael Watson's ivy resembles Angostura bitters. So there could be a colossally complex, nine-dimensional, let's go string theory for a moment and imagine the universe exists in nine dimensions. There could be this colossally complex, nine-dimensional predatory force that's out there. And my great, 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 great grandfather had some distortion in his brain that caused him to perceive it as giant cat. Right. And there's no more a giant cat than these bitters are a bucket of ivy. But boy, did he survive while his cousin, who was gazing in awe, this nine-dimensional specter got devoured. And that simplification got handed down. And then the interface theory of perception says that the UI is space-time. As we perceive it, as Newton perceived it, as Einstein said, actually, it's more complicated than you think. He was still just perceiving the desktop of the computer, although he was seeing it in a more fancy way than most of us. It really is just the user interface. Objects are icons. And what that means is when you look away from the chair, the chair ain't there anymore. Exactly right. The chair has no position, no momentum, no physical properties when it's not observed because the chair is not a pre-existing object in reality. It's a data structure that I create on the fly and destroy when I don't need it. And so if we're, again, to take the crossing the street idea, if that SUV is bearing down on you, if it's just an icon, why don't you just stay put? Because an icon never really hurt anybody. Great question. So I wouldn't step in front of the SUV for the same reason I wouldn't take my blue rectangular icon for an email I'm writing and carelessly drag it to the trash can. Not because I take the icon literally, the email is not blue and rectangular, but I do take it seriously. If I drag that icon carelessly to the trash can, I could lose all the work that I've done in that email. And if it was a letter or a book that I'm writing, then I'd be very, very careful because I could lose a year of work uh, dragging that icon to the trash can. And that's the key point. From an evolutionary point of view, as you pointed out, the symbols that we have have been shaped by natural selection to help us stay alive. We better take them seriously. But just because we take them seriously doesn't mean that we take them literally. So I take the icon seriously, but I don't take it literally. We tend to jump from, I must take it seriously, therefore, I must take it literally. That's actually a logical flaw. It's a logical error. 
going back to that proposition that I started with, that we see reality as it is because that is very adaptive evolutionarily, that seems logical. When we get to the point of saying, actually, space-time is a UI, and real reality is radically different from that, the question might be, well, why would we do such a thing? Why would we and our ancestors craft something that has no bearing to underlying reality? Your answer actually is evolutionary pressure, counterintuitively, that a species which sees reality in a pristinely accurate way competes with a rival species that throws away most or even all of reality for a more agile metaphor, the latter species will win every time. Is that correct? That's right. So I'm saying something that's even more radical than just the idea that our perceptions are simplification of reality. Most people would say, I understand that evolution is going to do things on the cheap and try to do things fast. And so we're going to get sketches of the table, not get the full detail of the table. And we'll just get sketches of things that we need to stay alive. I'm saying something more radical. I'm saying that when evolution by natural selection is shaping our perceptions, the selection forces are uniformly against anything at all like the truth. In evolutionary game theory, these functions tell you what payoffs you will get for the various actions you take, given the state of the world, given what creature you are, given your state. The whole game is to get more fitness payoffs than your competition. So if you do anything besides look at the payoffs, you're going to lose. And it turns out the fitness functions themselves are just utterly unlike objective reality. Now, this is what you call fitness before truth. That's right. And you've done a lot of mathematic modeling, which you argue supports this. That's right. So with two of my graduate students, Justin Mark and Brian Marion, we did genetic algorithms and evolutionary game simulations. We ran hundreds of thousands, even millions of randomly chosen worlds with resources that we would throw into them. And we would put creatures in these worlds. We played God. We let some creatures see all of the truth. We put others that saw nothing of the truth and were just tuned to the fitness functions. And we let them compete. And what we found uniformly was that organisms that saw the truth never outcompeted organisms of equal complexity that were just tuned to the fitness functions. They were in a world where they could wander around and forage for resources. It was a foraging game. But their perceptions had to evolve and their actions had to evolve. And so their initial actions were really stupid and their initial perceptions were completely crazy. But after 500 generations, the creatures that evolved were foraging optimally. And so we could look and see of those creatures that survived 500 generations and bred, what kind of perceptions did they have? None of them saw the truth. All of them were tuned to the fitness functions. And in fact, I doubt in the complex world that at any stage in the genetic evolution would a true perceiving creature ever arise. There would be no selection pressures for it to appear at any point. Now, one of the very weird elements...